So great to see you all here, folks. And I'm here with the brilliant Jessica Alstrom, legend. So we are going to have a chat tonight about the new era of love. And, and we're going to cover so many topics because this woman knows her stuff. She's got so many places you can go. So let's see where it rolls. It's always organic here. We just kick it off and see what happens. Um, you're all very welcome. I'm going to do what I always do at the very beginning. Just invite you all to drop into your heart center. So let go of that head. Close your eyes and take a couple of breaths into your heart center. Feel the power of that connection. Feel that sense of coming home. And feel yourself moving from the language of thinking to the language of feeling. So you're now in a resonant space. And just check in with your body. Just drop in and see how you're feeling. See a little light go on in your heart center. And I invite you as we do this event tonight that you stay here, that you don't feel the need for judgment. You don't feel the need for thinking. You stay in the heart center. And you take what resonates with your heart and you let go of the rest. No need to think about it. Just feel into it. If it feels right, you take it away. Now let that bring a smile to your face. Feel your whole body smiling, feel your heart smiling, feel your cells lighting up. As you open your eyes, you're all very welcome. And we're going to get straight into this. So Jessica Alstrom, you're very, very welcome. We haven't seen you in a couple of years. And you were in Ireland a couple of years ago with us live, which was amazing. You will be back live with us again soon, I'm very sure. Absolutely. In the meantime... Uh, this is how we're going to do it. Everybody yep. hear me okay? All good? Sound is all good? Okay. And just to say to people, I'm going to chat to Jessica for about 45 minutes. And then in the second half, we'll invite you to kick in your questions there. Just type them in the text box is the easiest way of doing it. And I'll read them out to Jessica. Um, so I'm going to keep you all on mute. And uh, as I said, you can type in. That's great. So Jessica Alstrom, you're very welcome. Delighted to have you. I love your work. I think it's really, really special. Uh, it's so diverse. You cover <laughs> so many subjects. And I really want to get in tonight and get as much for people as I possibly can out of that genius of yours. So I want to start right where we're, the topic of this evening is the new era of love. Mm -hmm. So you really feel that humanity is moving into that space that era of love, and you feel it's beginning now, 2021. Why do you feel that so strongly? Um, I, I don't feel it's beginning now. I feel it's been it's been a slow valve that's that's kind of been open, but I really feel like the floodgates have really kind of powered through, especially around December, you know, of last year. I kind of look at that that time capsule that energy is, is like the grand opening, right? It's like, if, if there was a like mall of America or, you know, something big was opening, it was like the grand opening, but you realize what goes into a grand opening, right? How many hours of building and, you know, people working behind the scenes and developing and practicing for this grand opening. So to me, kind of December 21st was like, okay, everyone is welcome. But before that, maybe even since 2012, we, the ones who are, you know, on the front line, teaching, mentoring, you know, getting our hands dirty, crying our eyes out, have been blood, sweat, and tears behind the scenes, kind of grounding and anchoring frequency, right? And getting a 
uh, getting a place ready to like walk in. Because one of the things about humanity is, is, is they want to see it before they can believe it, right? And so we were kind of the pioneers that are like, okay, well, they're going to want to see this. So we have to kind of be the example of that. And so we have been kind of working on our own our own lives, our own shadow work, our own realities to kind of be able to stand up and, and present and show, show that to the world. And so, you know, you've seen gurus and very famous people transcend over the last few years. You've seen them go through hell and back. And that was kind of our behind the scenes work. And so to me, it's kind of like delivery, right? It's like, okay, we're ready. We're open. Let's show you how to do this. And it's all based in play. Because to me, this whole era of love is, is more about returning to the inner child than it is about love because not one person that I've ever met in my entire life truly understands love. Because what it meant to us as a child doesn't mean now. Like as a child, love was unconditional without boundaries. It was adventurous. It wasn't personal. It wasn't, uh, I can't love you and you. It was all inclusive. It was this and that. It was yes. You know, it was excitement. It was opportunity. It was forever, right? And as we've gotten older, every single one of those things has been removed from us in order to love someone, right? I love you. I got to lose a part of me, right? If I love you, then this person's going to be upset with me. So I'm going to have to lose this person. Or I'm gonna to have to do this different, or I'm gonna to have to live over here. And, and so as we've gotten older, instead of love, yes, like love meaning creation and yes, love becomes no. And so people literally, as, as kind of an intuitive, when I'm working with someone and I say the word love, I can feel the trigger point in their sacral energy. It's like, ooh, love. It's almost like saying the word God is like, I don't know what I feel about that. Or, you know, it, it, love is actually a negative trigger word in the human body, because think about every single person that you love right now in your life, right? Shame, guilt, humiliation, present, resentment. God, we love them, but geez, they drive us crazy, right? You know, obligation, commitment issues, suffering, right? You, you love your parents, but you're a pain in the butt, right? It's like when you really think about how a child loves versus you and me at the ages that we are after all the reality that we have experienced, what does love mean now? And that's what we are here to change is to get back to that place where love meant love, not obligation, not suffering, not betrayal, not secrets, not loss, right? And it's about also understanding that the child does not care about your shadow, it still loves you, right? Think about who you were as a child. Your mom would say, oh, your dad is such a jerk, he left us. And that child's like, yeah, I just wanna know him. I just wanna see him, but he's a criminal. I don't care, I love him, right? He's my dad, right? When you think about that idea, it's like, oh no, I can't love you because of this, or I can't do this because you did this bad thing 25 years ago. Children do not live in that space. They're like you are here, I want to love you. And because you're here, I want you to love me. That's it. That is all there is. And so this wounding of this word no starts to actually build walls between our hearts, build walls between countries, worlds. So what I'm working on right now is kind of the resurrection of that inner child. Interesting that we're getting into the March energy, which is very powerful for resurrection. And instead of having an ego have to die, which I don't buy into, it's really about reparenting and, and getting back to, you know what, you were right all along you, as a child, like you were right. You were right to love all of us. You were right to sing and dance and not care about who was watching. You were right to, to choose your own reality and pretend. I mean, how is it that innately a child knows how to pretend before they can talk? Because Pretending is the essential fiber of creating reality. And we tell them, stop pretending, stop visualizing, stop using your imagination, get to school, get to work. And we're taught to love that. 
So by the time we're 35, 45, 55, love is tainted. So as an intuitive, when I'm working through trigger words, I'm like, wow, love is a, is a sore spot for you. Even though you're saying, I want to meet my soulmate this year. I can't wait. I'm throwing myself out there. I'm like, <laughs> I'm not sure you want to do that until we reconcile this, this program. Because what you really think about love is that it's abandoning, it's rejecting, it's judging, you know, it's critical, right? It's, it's only going to love you if you look a certain way or have something. And so you think love is conditional, but yet you're putting yourself out there. So you're going to find yourself in a sabotage because what you say you want and what you believe don't match. And that's kind of my job as a mentor is to call you out on where you're speaking three different perspectives and asking the universe to give you one solution. Right. If my ego is saying love is for, you know, love doesn't exist. Right. And your inner child is like, I just miss my dad. I just miss my mom. So your child is in a broken heart and your higher self is like, love is all we are. It's very confusing for the universe to bring you a partner that is going to be a match to what you truly desire because you actually don't know what you don't know and you don't know what you want. You know what 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 you don't want. Jessica, you know the way we're always told that we got to love ourselves Mm -hmm. before we can really meet someone and love them. Is that a true statement or is that a bit of a cliche? What do you feel about that statement? Love yourself. Well, I would say that it's, again, it's that word. It's like, what does loving yourself mean? Accepting that you don't like certain things. To me, loving yourself is more about understanding yourself, right? Right. If you look at the word acceptance, allowing, and understanding, that's love, right? Love is not something you can just go right to. It's too much of a quantum leap, right? If you have been taught not to love yourself, then someone's saying, okay, as soon as you get to self-love, you'll meet your partner. You're going, well, if I don't even know what that is, if I ask my, you know, my mom hit me and then she told me she loved me. So if I starve myself, does that mean I'm loving me? Because then I'm going to be skinny, So again, it's understanding what love really is. But to answer your question, 100%, you will never meet the person of your dreams if you are not the person of your dreams, right? You have to become your soul's mate, right? You have to become your greatest partner if you want to attract your greatest partner. Now, if you're not your greatest partner, you're still going to attract partners but they're going to mirror back to you the hidden parts of your own consciousness where you are not right with you, right? So let's say this example, because the universe works perfectly in metaphors, not stories. So if I'm lying to myself, like say I gave up my hopes and dreams 15 years ago, right? I'm lying to myself every day. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. I'm lying to myself. I'm actually going to be attracted to liars, And then I'm going to be triggered at you for lying to me. And now I can blame you and I can push you away and I can tell everybody there's no good men in the world. And, you know, they're all liars. Right. And when I, when I'm in a session, I'll say, okay, so where are you lying? And they're like, I'm not lying. Okay. Well, what about this? What is your true hope and dream? Well, I wanted to be an architect. Well, what are you? I'm working in a law firm. That's a lie. You know what I mean? It's like, let me find to you where you are, where you are hurting yourself by denying your own love, your own joy, your own creation, and making that someone else is responsible to, for you to have a great life. Mm. All these attractions are going to do is show you where you are in a lie, right? Same with cheating, same with all these things. If someone says, I keep getting cheated on, I'm like, okay, where are you cheating yourself? Where are you cheating your own dreams? Where are you cheating? You know, one of the biggest childhood wounds that I ever see, and I, I teach this in my workshops, is not keeping your word. We think it's getting, you know, sexually abused as a child, or we think it's, you know, we're getting beat up as a child. Trust me, I've been through all of that. My greatest childhood wound was when someone promised something and didn't deliver or didn't keep their word because that creates inconsistency and safety issues. 
And when someone is constantly telling you one thing and doing another, it puts you in this idle place of creation where you're like waiting for your life to start. Or do you think we have weight issues? Like I'm waiting for my life to start. I'm waiting for this to be okay. I'm waiting for you to say yes. So for you, when you go and you all have done this, I've done this, we, we're in this place of, okay, tomorrow I'm getting my shit together. Excuse my language. I'm going to get up. I'm going to do this. I'm going to take my power back. I'm going to break up with that guy. I'm going to do this, this, this. And the next day you don't follow through. Mm -hmm. What are you teaching the end of child within you? Right? No, I can't trust her. And that is when your life starts to go absolutely horrible is when you lose your own trust because if you cannot keep your own word to yourself right consistency discipline honoring yourself loyalty to yourself being attracted to yourself why would we expect anybody else to do any different but we've been taught at this young age that what love truly is is selflessness right i will give up me to love you Mm -hmm. Now, what we think is going to happen in return is because I gave up me, you're going to do the same for me. But every single person listening to me understands that that never happens. Because the more empathic you are, the more you can give away of yourself, because the more you see the need in with someone else, right? Oh, I need to give this away because this bothers you or this triggers you or you don't like when I do this. But notice how they're never doing that for us. And in, in, in that way of the impact, like, wow, a taker, right? We'll keep taking. A rescuer will always need more rescuing. So that's when resentment falls in, right? I've given up this whole path for you and you've given up nothing. And you've given up nothing because I've asked you to give up nothing, right? I, I love you so much that I've asked you to give up nothing, but in order for you to love me back, I have to give up this, 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 this. Right. And so then what happens is we, we, we just convolute love. And it's just like kind of like having a baby. If there's any women out there, it's like the worst pain in the whole world. We're never doing this again. We jump right back in and do it again because it's like just like this. I'm never going to fall in love again. And then we just jump right back in there and like, OK, I think I'm ready to do this again. Mm. Even though we haven't really reconciled anything within our ourselves about what we're actually needing. Right. And just to be really frank in the universe, the universe only speaks yes. That's it. There is no no. That's why when you tell a child no, it's like, what? Huh? I I'm not resonating with that as a, you know, gamma soul incarnation here. Like, I don't get it. Right. So when we start imprinting no into everything, don't do that. Don't say that. Don't be that. Don't feel that. Don't think that. Like, don't take that personally. Don't do anything. Don't feel like what we do is we get this very altered state of ourselves. And that's actually what creates the ego identity is this false sense. Oh, okay. Well, now I've got to judge whether everything is right or wrong because just being me is obviously bad. So we separate from ourselves. The inner child kind of goes into a dormant situation and we get kind of analytical in our survival. So if I'm analytical in my survival and I'm searching for love, I'm looking for someone to, to make sense on my list. Like has a good job, comes from a good family, or it has a good backbone. Like if I ask my son who's eight, what are you looking for in a best friend? He's not gonna be like, well, he makes 50 grand a year and you know he has this little <laughs> one and he's gonna be like, he's nice to me. He's available, right? He's home, right? He wants to play. But us, like, think about the last time you were single, if you were, like, what were you looking for in a partner, you know? And I started doing this, and this workshop that I'm right about to finish is one of my most vulnerable workshops that I've ever done because I used my own life experiment on my quest for connecting to a partnership of love. Right. I've been married twice. I've got four kids. I've made every mistake. Right. And that was because I kept to taking my wounded version of love out on the market. Right. I kept taking me who was, you know, broken, basically, in this idea of love out searching for another partner, another answer, another solution. Right. And when I I really sat back and thought, OK, so what does love mean to my body like 
if I look at how my mom treated me, my dad treated me, my teachers treated me, you know, my, my kids, my everybody, it's like, what's this, what's the like root? Like, what's the, the feeling, right? Well, I could say, honestly, love is pain, right? Mm. Being a young mom, like what I had to do to take care of them was extremely painful, right? I was an abused child. That was painful, right? Two failed marriages. That was painful. Losing my grandmother was painful. Every single person, my, my dog, like love, if I ask my body, oh, love is pain. Yet here I am on the dating app, right? <laughs> Searching for someone who fits my criteria. Now, when I looked at my criteria, I realized that I was trying to avoid pain. So when you write down like what you're looking for in a partner, and you're like, okay, it's good to my kids, which means I don't want someone to hurt my kids. Mm. I'm preparing for pain. You know, someone has a good job. I don't want to feel financially strapped. Like your actual list is to protect yourself from pain. It's not, I want to play mate who's home at five o'clock, who, you know, likes to rub my back and laugh at my jokes. Like, that's not what we're looking for, but that's what mm. we should be looking for if we were true with ourselves. And so to talk, just, just to ask you as well about the, so I had an experience once where I was kind of in love with this person, this lady, and I felt like it was kind of unrequited, right? Yes. And I was like, but I was crazy about this lady. But what I did was I didn't tell her how I felt, right? And then she decided she was moving away. And I thought, <laughs> I was like, how, I can, how, can I, how can I deal with this, you know? But she was just real casual about it. And I remember having this moment where I thought the love that you're feeling inside of yourself, it's not about this person. It's about you, right? So it's this old classic that I've heard a few times of, a lot of us are running around trying to get love from somebody yeah. else, but it's really about giving it, right? It's really about like expressing what's already in you it is. towards that other person. So right. just can you, can you, with that framework, can you tell us about the new, how you see a new relationship, how oh. that's going to look in the new, the new consciousness? The new consciousness of love, and everyone needs to really understand this anchor, is that we are moving from attachment to connection. Okay, that's the new era of love. And, and that, that like triggers people like, what do you mean you're not committing, right? If, I, if I'm unattached and I'm connected, does that mean that I'm not committed? And, and so we have to look at that, right? We have to look at what every relationship that has been symbolic in love has been about entanglement. It's about codependency. It's about attachment. It's about, it's about like anchoring in and rooting in, in someone else. And that has always caused us pain because that's never why we were here. So it was like you said, it's unrequited. And then you realized, okay, so I was needing, right? And this new era of love is a, you will not reach a state of even understanding connection if you need love, right? Right. If you need love, you're not going to understand how true connection works because connection is about experiencing being able to give and receive love. So when you said it's just about giving, no, just your breath is giving and taking. True connective love is about freely without conditions without judgments without you know stipulations giving and receiving love i think some of you guys's biggest pain that you've experienced is wanting to love someone so much but they couldn't handle you the very essence of how much you actually had to give they couldn't they, i can't they either run away they get triggered Right. And, and some of our broken heart just comes from like, who can I give this to? Like, it's so much like, you know, and, and it, it scares people at times. Right. And, and then and then they are like unrequited, like they're not there to give it back. Or we've all had that experience where someone else is like, I have so much to give you. And you're like, yeah, I don't want that. <laughs> like, that's just not what I'm into. Right. It's yeah. like that, that quintessential wound of I can't have what I want, which is a childhood. No. If you look back at all the things you loved as a child, and I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about things that you loved, 
your favorite tree, your favorite cat, your favorite dog, your favorite teacher, your favorite book, right? It's like we were, we put the book down and we didn't love it any less, right? It's like you go to your favorite restaurant, but you don't like go through a loss when you leave the restaurant. Like, oh, I'm not going to eat there every second of the day. Love is about experiencing the, the, the give and the receive in the moment. Now, I'm not saying you're going to change your mind and have 50 different lovers. That is not what I'm saying, because I think the true era of love is really about finding another person who is in love with themselves and wants to share that with you. Think about it. I'm so in love with myself. I cannot wait for you to be able to share this this and because I get to share it I get to receive how much you love you that's connection attachment mm -hmm. is I have a void I need you to fill it mm. and you have a void I need to fill it so now you can't go anywhere without each other because you don't feel whole you feel that yeah it's like the old paradigm is kind of you give some you get some and you talked about the pain this new mm -hmm. paradigm is I'm in love with myself. You're in love with yourself. Let's meet in the middle and share this stuff. That's nice. Beautiful. And, you know, that's why, that's, that's why I did this workshop because I want to be able to help people into that. I am so in love with me. I cannot wait to share it with you. And you meet someone else and they're like, oh my gosh, I love myself too. And you're like, that's a true playground experience right? That is being able to connect and, and kind of ha have that experience without losing one ounce of you, right? You don't lose any of your essence because you're giving away your extra, right? You have so much extra that nobody could deplete you because you're literally running at equal speed instead of waiting for someone to catch up or hoping they wake up or hoping they get better because you love them. That paradigm is love is pain. The new paradigm is love is freedom, mm. which means that when you actually meet someone who loves themselves as much as you love yourself, the expansion of what the two of you could create is is limitless because it's it, uh, like i say you know like 3d love old school love is a subtraction problem i've got to lose something the new era of love is multiplication i am like you know it's like two becomes four four becomes eight instead of me losing anything we're creating a momentum and if you look at duality it's the infinity symbol that is basically one circle with a belt on Right. So it's actually like two people being able to come and have very visceral different experiences and then come together to share that. And the large scale that that can create is is insane. And so I'm actually getting to live this right now, like my whole life, you know, even the reason why that I started, you know, learning about quantum physics and studying early childhood development and biochemistry and all the things that I have under my belt, all selfish, right? Never like, I'm gonna go save humanity. It was all like, I wanna figure this out. Like all I ever wanted when I was a little girl was to find my person, right? Live happily ever after, be a teacher, right? Have some kids. I didn't have like hopes of being a famous writer or anything like that. If someone would have told me I was doing what I was doing now, I would have laughed at them. <laughs> but this experience that I've been on has been about being able to get me to this place that I am right now. And that's why I can say this with so much passion, because not only do I know it exists analytically, I'm actually getting to live this. Sure, sure. It's, um, before we started there, we had a little chat and you mentioned about the negative being a shortcut. Mm -hmm. And I like the way you said that. So we all reach moments in our lives where we go into these kind of dark nights of the soul and stuff like that. But you spoke about, and I suppose humanity at the moment is going through a bit of a, a, a tricky, uh, you know, a tricky time for some people, but we have this choice point within it, right? Mm -hmm. We always have choices. And a lot of us have turned this into 
kind of gold, you know, some people have really got into, this is actually grand, so I'm okay, I can work with this, you know. Mm -hmm. So this kind of ability to be a little magician amidst Absolutely. all of what's going on is amazing. So mm -hmm. talk to us a bit about, you know, the negativity and how it leads to shortcuts and healing and also that choice point. I want to touch on those two. Yeah, I mean, you don't ever really know you have a choice when you're 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 running away from pain, right? And and I think that we're all kind of running away from pain. And that's why I said negatives are shortcuts, because that negative is like finally having to face that bully on the playground, right? Your darker than the night of the soul is only you having to face that bully on the playground. And every movie you've ever seen where you finally face your bully on the playground guess what courage and understanding and love returns so what we're what we spend our whole life doing is chasing chasing a better life chasing our hopes chasing our dreams but we've been avoiding pain right so it's kind of like okay i don't feel loved as a child guess what i'm going to be chasing my whole life love i don't feel appreciated as a child guess what i'm going to chase appreciation and up until the COVID moments, right, we were all in this serious addiction of chase, like chase, 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 chasing the future, chasing the future, avoiding the past, terrified of the present moment, because in the present moment, guess what you have to see the bully on the playground, like I can't be here. So I got to keep running into what I possibly might have, see. And so when you realize is that your true choice is I can deal with this now and it'd be horrible. Or I can have a slowly horrible existence for the rest of my life, right? Because I'm avoiding feeling horrible. And the universe only knows yes. So if I'm avoiding pain, pain is going to be in every moment of my day hidden. Whatever you're avoiding is the fabric of your entire life. So if I'm, if I'm fearing being humiliated, I'm going to find it in my daily routine because the universe doesn't know. No, no. Keep humiliation away from me. It creeps in. Have you noticed how your loved ones, your intimate relationships, random strangers, they know exactly what button to push. Like, how do they know this? Because we think that we're hiding, you know, our biggest fears by being successful or beautiful or having money, but there's always a crack because truly we are the alchemist. And our job is to look at that pool that we have built around our heart, the heart being gold, and going into that vulnerability, which is true courage. Like, okay, so what if I get hurt? You know, so what if this bully kicks my butt? So what if you dump me? So what if you leave me? What happens if I just told you I loved you anyways? Right? Oh my gosh, then I'd be vulnerable. Then you could destroy me. Then you could hurt my pride and my ego. So what? Children don't care. Mm. Right? I love you anyways, even if you don't love me. It doesn't take away from their ability to love you. So this is the new era of, of basically courage is true vulnerability. Because if I can be vulnerable, because I can't lose any part of myself because I love myself, then you can't technically destroy me. Because if you decide, whoa, you're just too this, okay. But that does not stop me from loving me. I just have to find somebody who also loves himself the same way. And this is what I see every day in my practice is they either come to me because they want money, they want a healthy body, they want the perfect partner, you know, they want to fix something, right? And they always want it outside of them. And, and they never want to like necessarily like take full responsibility for what they are wanting outside of them. They don't believe exists within that's why you get these relationships that feel like heroin like they're super toxic but they're super like it's like ecstasy and you can't get away from them because what you're actually attracted to in them is parts of yourself that you've denied and rejected which is why they can't truly love you if you notice that those twin flames are the ones who just no matter what you do they just either can't commit or they can't love you but it's just it feels so perfect that you're like you know, calling psychics every day. This person feels so perfect to me. Why can't I have them? You know, and you're going, oh, because they're a reflection of you. They're showing you the parts of yourself that you won't let yourself have. You know, I ask all my clients, what did you used to get in trouble for when you were a kid? That is your sweet spot of creation, right? 
So I used to get in trouble for lying as a kid. Well, guess what I do for a living now? Not lying professionally and getting paid for, but teaching people how to pretend, right? Create their own reality. So there's so much magic in this, but when we, when we hide parts of ourselves, we make it someone else's job to give it to us. And when they do not give it to us, then we can go into loss. Then we can go into judgment. Then we can go into resentment. Then we can run away. And then we can forget our pain for a while. We can dust ourselves off, move into a new location and change our hair and start over. So we don't realize that we're actually just on a hamster wheel instead of forward motion ever. It's the same old flavor. And what you said there is very fascinating because basically um, unconditional love, we always think of that as being like, you know, we're going to love no matter what the other person does. But actually what I'm seeing now from what you said was unconditional love. Don't even bring conditions into it. It's a separate energy almost. It's like mm-hmm. all of these things that you're going to block your love off for, it's kind of only really hurting you. So take them out of the equation. Let the person do whatever they want to do. And as you said, you can find somebody else. But mm-hmm. you remain in this unconditional mode, no matter what's right. going on around you. That's right. brilliant. And that puts you in a state of constant creation because you're not having to dim your light and turn your volume down because, you know, we all, we all as humans have baggage, you know, and what your baggage technically exists of is, is not your past. Your past is not your baggage. Your past, it, your baggage is what you've hidden from yourself. It is the parts of you that you don't want anyone else to see or know about. It is your unresolved pain. It is your secret shame. It is your secret addictions. It is not your past. It is not your parents. It is not your storyline. It is what you believe is wrong. It is what you believe is disgusting. It is what you feel is, is, you know, unworthy, undeserving. And what we do is because we don't want anyone to see it, we pack it in our bodies. And because we are biochemical and electromagnetic, We think nobody can see it, right? But because everything is reflective and your cells are literally kind of like projectors, right? Oh, I'm going to stick this, this anger towards my, you know, fact that men always leave me right in my liver. No one's going to see it in there, right? And so all of a sudden, you know, you're pushing anger into your liver and then you meet someone who you're like, I'm so angry, but I can't feel this. Now I've got a liver issue saying, I'm right here, right? It's like, and now you can be mad at your doctor and you can get your anger out in all these different ways. So you're never really ever hiding anything because you're always going to manifest what you are hiding because there is no hiding. It's like a child going playing hide and seek, standing right there out in front going, can you see me? I'm like, clear as day because the universe is, is not like, it can see everything through your body, right? So it's like, oh, I'm going to push this resentment deep into you know, my heart chakra, right? And, and, and that's why I said every negative shortcut, because the, fa- the further I compact this pain into my body, the more pressurized I become. Okay. Now what happens to a pressurized volcano? Okay. Mm-hmm. It's going to explode. And, and because there is one constant in the universe and that is change, you can only fill up so much space without needing to make room right? You got to pop that balloon at some point. And this is what your dark nights are. This is what, this is what's happening is your body is like, we can't do this anymore. So the disease pops up dark night of the soul, the divorce pops up dark night of the soul, the money issue. This is all a projection of very compressed, very suppressed feelings and pain, always about love, always, because love is all we actually are. You think money is money. No money is love. Like, what do you want to do with money? You want to help people. You want to buy things that make you feel loving. You want to do, th- it's all love. No, there's no other thing. There's nothing else. So all suppression is love. So now I've hid this anger in my, my tummy and I'm kind and I'm gentle and I'm an empath and I'm a light worker and I'm out giving my soul to everybody every day. And then I meet this person and I'm like, oh, Eureka, you're my soulmate. And guess what they're going to do? Vibrate the same energy of what you're hiding 
and you're kind of come into their space and start vibrating that pain up like a volcano and boom, either you're going to get angry or you're going to watch them be angry because you're not allowed to be. And you're going to have the explosion that you need, higher self, right? The very big version of you is like, oh, thank goodness. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, it's like, let's have this experience because the dark night is you having to go to the playground and see this bully. And all pain, you guys, is, is just unprocessed feelings. And we always push ourselves into situations where we have to process it to get to the next level. So everybody here right now who's wanting this new love is going to have to meet their bully at the playground and process their pain. But here's the cool thing about where we are as self-awareness is, I mean, I would say we all are, are starting to really like ourselves. You know what I mean? It's like, I, wow. Like, you know, we've done so much work. Some of us has been doing mm -hmm. Baptist for 30 years and, mm -hmm. and at the end of the day, I'm like, okay. So you kind of need to be able to like yourself to meet your own bully at the playground, yeah, right? Yeah, Cause you'll avoid yeah. it. You'll take the long way home your whole life. If you do not feel that you are, you know, okay. Cause okay. Guess what? Confidence, confidence equals courage, courage. I can meet you at the playground. So what if you kick my ass? Why what? So I fall down, but then I don't have to face you again. And that's what keeps people away from love and in these toxic relationships, because they don't want to see the pain inside of them. They want to blame someone else for bringing the pain out or, you know, making them feel bad. But what is happening is you can never feel pain unless you are. No one can actually hurt you unless it exists. That's why I said, when you fully love yourself, you don't have any of that in your body. So someone could literally attack you, belittle you, you know, hurt you and be like, okay, well, that's great that I don't feel that about me. Mm -hmm. I can only take that personally if I secretly feel that. Mm -hmm. So I don't feel that. Okay, that's your opinion. Wow, thank you for sharing. I love you. And they're like, wait, what? Well, I love you. I see that you have pain and you probably need some love right now. And guess what? I've got some extra because I love myself so much. It is a completely non judgmental experience and it really freaks people out. It will cause them to run as far away as they can from you. Sure. But guess what? You've given them the seed. Whoa. Remember that girl like two years ago? She like mm. liked me, even though I was at, like, you know? <laughs> and that's what I practiced in my new relationship is this fullness, this completedness of, I don't need you. Right? I, you know, I just love you. Yeah. I don't need you. I just love you as brilliant. You know? I just love you. Like yeah. I don't need you. And if you're, yeah. if, if you go away, I still love you. Mm -hmm. If you mm -hmm. change your mind, I still love you. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Impasse, even though people have done a sturdy, you still love everybody that you've ever loved. Yeah. Yeah. That has never changed in your heart because mm -hmm. it's never been conditional. But we are so afraid of, of what's going to happen with our pride that we have this ultra wound that I find in every one of my clients is called sabotage. And why do we sabotage? Well, I need to leave you before you leave me. Right? I need to reject you before you reject me. Just like they take this woman who you said you felt so love, so much love for, she probably felt the same, but couldn't handle what you might bring out in her. And so needed to reject you. So she didn't have to reject herself. You know what I mean? So it's like, mm -hmm. this is why taking things personally doesn't happen when you have a, a certain level of self-love. Like you don't take it personally when someone can't handle what you've got to give. You're just like, yeah, I'm. So like, you don't take it personally when the sun tries to blind you. It's just big, right? But if you and meet it's someone like when else. You describe the, when you meet these partners and they activate this, this stuff within you, they're mm -hmm. actually a, a great healing force coming into your life. But if you go then into it, the blame game, then right. you're kind of, you're missing the point, right? Then but you, I want to lead do... on now with a little bit to hacks because yeah. you're great at the, the life hacks, you know? And mm -hmm. I want to get into a few of those for people. So People are watching here now who don't want to repeat those kind of cycles of meeting this person who activates this stuff within them. How do they hack while they can now work on themselves before they meet a partner or before they bring love into their lives? How can they hack into that stuff and let it go 
on their own. Biohacking, you guys, is kind of the opposite of what you think. You think that, you know, when you think of biohacking, it's a shortcut, right? You're going to have, you're going to be able to jump steps, right? And it's actually the opposite of, of this in, in the understanding of how the quantum universe works. So it's the, it's the opposite of this, but you go faster. So hear me out. Normally what you do is in your life, you, you jump over things you don't want to experience. You go to the happy moments, you go to the instant gratifications, you go to the pill that's going to numb your pain. And you think that you're ha- you're biohacking that, but in essence, you cannot, you cannot jump over a step in your own self-realization in your own enlightenment process. You cannot. So you're actually going so much slower, the faster you're trying to go. Okay, really hear me here because it's kind of a paradox. The faster I try to go, the slower I'm going. Okay, so I'm, I'm working on a, a huge course right now called Parallel Realities and Quantum Leaping because I literally have these formulas. What it is, is about being present and facing the bully. But your whole life is, how do I get around the bully? How do I shortcut over here? How do I get over there? How do I get over here? Because we're so terrified of meeting this bully that we want someone to love us so we don't have to feel the bully inside of us. We want someone to to appreciate us so we don't feel unappreciated. We want someone to fill the voids. So what we actually have to do is the the true biohack is to, to look at all the things that trigger you, right? This is a great, a very great biohack is to literally, and I call your intimates, your closest reflections, your intimate relationships are your greatest spiritual teachers, throw away all the gurus, all you need is your intimate relationships, intimate into me, I see, I'm going to get the closest reflection to my bully. Notice how the ones we love treat us the worst, right? Mm -hmm. Like the closest reflection of my bully is going to be found in my intimate relationships, even in my own self talk, I can find it. Write down what triggers you. Like, okay, take my mom. What does she trigger? Well, she doesn't listen to me. Okay, good. Throw away that story. Go into the feeling, like Paul said. But how does it make me feel? Unworthy. Great. Mom, I feel unworthy. Not she triggers me because she doesn't listen to me. Because that's a sob story. No, she doesn't doesn't listen to me. No, what does that feel like when someone does not listen to you? I feel like I'm devalued. I'm unworthy. Devalued means I'm worth less, worth less. So now I'm trying to go into situations and feel worthy instead of going, okay, is that true? Do I have a choice here? Because choice is actually the only thing you technically own in the universe. You don't own the body, you don't own the money, right? You just own the choice. So if I said, okay, my mom made me feel unworthy. So I'm chasing all of this worthiness with this career and these relationships. But if I actually went back and said, the worthiness is the bully and really sat with myself about who and what I am and maybe did some inner work there, it might feel like I'm going slower, right? It might feel like, oh, God, I'm stopping and I'm having to process this or look at this while everyone else is running ahead of me. I'm in comparison and everyone's having the life over there that I want, but guess what? They're running in a circle. They're going to come back to their bully. So if I stop and, and I find the story in the trigger, but I then go into the feeling, I feel unworthiness, right? I feel humiliated. My dad humiliated me, right? Okay. My kids, they don't appreciate me. What does that feel like? Wow. So what do you start to notice is this unworthiness is everywhere. And what is your inner child's definition of unworthiness? Because I speak inner child, because, you know, what is unworthiness? It's one word. Well, two, I'm really not allowed. I'm not allowed. So what are you not allowed to be? Me. Your biohack is to remember how to be you. Not fix your worthiness, not work on your deserving issues, not work on, you know, being more enlightened and studying more books is how do I remember how to be allowed to be me? Because the definition in your child's heart of unworthiness is I'm not allowed. 
And when you're not allowed so much, you forget how to use your internal guidance system, which is your GPS, which is your intuition, which is your connection to spirit, where all of your genius is. So technically, because you buy into I'm not allowed, you stop working on being amazing and you settle for other people who are amazing. I love you because you're amazing. I read your books because you're amazing. And I'm looking at you going, and so are you. Oh no, I'm not allowed. So all you actually have to do is figure out how to be allowed. And when you become allowed, you give yourself the worthiness, you give yourself your own value. You, sell, you give all the things that children give themselves because you're never gonna get worthiness from any job you do, how much money. I've met multi, multi, multi millionaires who literally build walls of money to hide unworthiness. So it has nothing to do with what you do. It is just what you allow for yourself. Like, okay, I'm allowed to be annoying. That's what everyone says. I'm allowed to be talkative. I'm allowed to be quirky. I'm allowed to be eccentric. I'm allowed to make mistakes. I'm allowed to be broken. I'm allowed to be, all of a sudden, you start to tell your child this. Is that, oh, she like, wait, wait, what? What are we allowed to do? Because you do not break a spirit with abuse. You break a spirit by telling them they're not allowed to be themselves. That is the only thing that breaks a spirit is when you take the authentic space away. So the and hack I, is allowing yourself to be yourself. That's right to the juice of it. That's, that's the, the there's only one biohack. Mm -hmm. And how we get there is, is one of those ways of finding all the triggers, right? Now, it, I love duality because you can find both your trigger points of where you're hiding pain, but you can also find where your genius is in this work too. It's like, okay, make a list of your triggers, right? What triggers you about each person, how they make you feel, right? And then look at that and then allow yourself to be yourself and then go over to who inspires me because this is the fun quantum space because you're, 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 Pain is being triggered by the memories that are sitting in your body, but your spirit is triggering you through inspiration. The people who you actually think are the greatest people in the world are actually a reflection of you who you won't let yourself be. Mm -hmm. Think about all the people, your muses out there, your favorite writers, your favorite authors. You're like, wow, they're so amazing. All they are doing is what? Allowing themselves. The only difference between them and you is they are allowing themselves to be. And if you actually hear their story of how they got to where they are, all they did was allow themselves, allow themselves to fail, allow themselves to be wrong, allow themselves to get their heart broken, allow themselves to be left. And guess who's left at the end of the day when all that goes away? Oh, I'm still here. Mm -hmm. So if you just work on allowing yourself, you don't need to learn how to love yourself. Trust me, you did. You loved yourself so much. I mean, my son, he'll be like, mom, look what I can do. Look what I can do. He's showing off, not because he's arrogant, because he's so proud of what he can do in his body. That is not arrogance. That is, look what I can do. I'm like, wow, buddy, look at what you can do with your body. And he's allowing himself. He's not like, oh, I, I can't do that. Somebody's going to laugh at me. Mm -hmm. Someone's going to judge me. Right. And then we're taught that being a good person is to not show off. But all kids do is show off because they're so impressed by what they can do. I mean, three months, they can barely move their hand. Eight years old, they're doing cartwheels. They're super proud of it. If you could actually allow yourself, you would be so self-obsessed with what you could do that you would tap into the genius of why you're on this planet. And you would tap into the, the true purpose of why you came instead of living in inspiration of why other people came. You would actually be like, wow, your work is so good, but so is mine. Your book is amazing. Have you read mine? Right. <laughs> I have a song that would go with that book. This is where soulmates come in. Right. I have illustrations that would go with that book because it's like a puzzle piece. Boom. I don't take away from you by loving me and you don't take away from you by loving me. We actually just kind of go together like an orchestra because you're super good at playing the piano and I'm super good at the flute. What would that sound like together? But if I'm not allowing myself and you're not allowing yourself and then we find ourselves attracted to each other to show, 
The only reason you're attracted to anyone is to show you your own pain, by the way, or to show you your own heart. Mm. And when you start to magnetize towards people who are just as loving towards themselves as you, and they don't take things personally and they don't need from you, they just want to be like, hey, I got a song, you got a book, let's put this together. You're like, oh my gosh, I actually like being on this planet. It's amazing. I'm not bored anymore. I'm not in pain. You know what I mean? So it's like all of a sudden you really start to be able to get out in that playground because there is no bully. So uh, anybody wants to type in questions, feel free. Um, we'll move into our Q&A part in a minute. So if anybody has any questions on any of these topics so far, feel free or anything you want to ask Jessica, go for it. We'll go for about 30 more minutes with questions. And I just want to ask you um, about 5D, fifth dimensional consciousness. We were talking, I was thinking about this earlier on. So the planet it, like talk to us about the planet and also about humanity. The planet is moving into a different level of consciousness, a different mm -hmm. frequency band. Okay. Mm -hmm. I think that's kind of becoming obvious photon belts, everything happening with the earth. Okay. Mm -hmm. Humanity is humanity stepping into becoming multidimensional so they can inhabit any frequency they wish, or will we all collectively move to 5d as well? I know this is all just kind of, new age talk and new age speak, but it's kind of fun. But what's your take on all of that kind of stuff? 5D. It goes perfectly with what we said. You will, you will have all of those experiences if you allow yourself. Because here's the thing, you know, Earth is, and, and I've taught a lot about this in my, in my um, academy, Earth is, is a very important planet, all right? And she's, a, she's important because she, she is the living library, which means she has, it's all completely free will and everything and no thing can all exist simultaneously in her, in her presence. Okay. So the way she can hold so much data and so many different species and so much different kinds of energies and so many different dimensions is because every, I don't know, thousands and thousands of years, what she does is she takes all of her information and she compresses it like a zip drive, like zoop. that's why we have so much gold on this planet. We have so many beautiful gems because of this process. She goes through this ascension and this de-ascension process where she goes in like a trash compactor, like boom. And then all the data of all the experiences and all the species and all everything gets really compressed into this, this like zip drive. And then she begins her journey again of opening back up, kind of like a cervix, right? When you're delivering a baby. And she goes through this process and she has been going through this process for since creation started because as earth can be a living library, there can be fragments of all information. If, if there was gonna be like an Akashic record in, in existence, it would be earth because everything can exist here. So what that means for us is we are in her process. We are in her process of moving from 5D right now because we're already in 5D into the sixth dimension. The sixth dimension is where we start to learn about that light and movement where time and space start to be a choice, which means that we can start utilizing our DNA extremely differently because we are kind of a micro of the macro of Earth. So if she can compress, we can compress and we can also expand. And with the DNA that you have right now, the brain that you have right now, you have super consciousness available, okay? So as we expand, right, we will move into that higher level of consciousness. It'll kind of look like this. First, oh, I can't hear you now. I lost your okay, volume. Jessica, go yep. ahead, go ahead, sorry. Yeah. Um, okay, I'll, I'll speed up here. Yeah. Basically what, what it means is that we, if we allow ourselves, because you have free will choice, you do not have to go with this process, but it'll feel like you're caught in a hurricane if you don't. If you go through this natural process, you will move into higher levels of consciousness. And, but when we say you want to love yourself, basically what you want is to get to that state of isness that I am complete. And then you can receive all of the downloads and everything that's happening on earth. If you're in resistance, I'm unworthy. Don't you think that you would also free will choose to not take those downgrades and those upgrades? Like you would, 
you would choose because you don't feel worthy to go, right? You'd stay over here instead of going to the VIP. But that's conscious choice that you don't know is conscious because you're hiding from your pain. That's so why I'm like, just expose it. I mean, if we're getting more light on the planet, that just means your dirty garage has got a spotlight now. So let's go in there and unpack it. That's your biohack. That's your shortcut. That's the only way to actually go in and live a 5D reality is sit and unpack your stuff. Right? Sit and unpack your stuff. Okay. We got our first question here, Jessica. So let's see where that's gone. So, um, Lacey is asking when claiming responsibility in our relationships and eliminating blames, how can we express this ownership perspective in conversations to our loved ones that his may be a foreign concept for? Mm. Well, you know, one of the, the essential love languages between 5D consciousness and 3D consciousness is responsibility, right? And, and your your um your bridge in in taking responsibility is appreciation appreciation is a glue that holds people together so if you're noticing something about your partner and they might not be on this journey where you can have these these conversations right so you're kind of like wow i have a big responsibility like i have more consciousness in this relationship and they might be asserting blame on me for something that they need to take responsibility for right then what you can do to either show them, right, or, or take responsibility yourself is to share with them some of your own vulnerability. Okay, this is magic. So say your, your, your spouse is not taking responsibility for something and they're blaming you. Mm -hmm. Right? I've had this happen, of course, in every relationship, like you can see it clearly that it's their issue, but they're blaming you for it. And the reason why they're blaming for it you is because you're tuning forking their pain they're, you're pulling their pain out they're like, stop doing that stop pulling my pain out it's your fault you're the problem right so one of the love languages in vulnerability is responsibility like if you truly loved yourself you would have no pride or no problem taking responsibility for it you'd be like i am so sorry that i am hurting you even though consciously you're not hurting them they're hurting themselves you're just a mirror, right? I'm so sorry that I'm hurting you. I'm so sorry that I'm bringing this out in you, right? And then all of a sudden switch over into appreciation. Like I appreciate how honest you're being about this. I appreciate how transparent you're being. I'm, I appreciate that you're actually showing me your feelings and your pain because I know that's brave. Because if you know that what you're bringing out of them is their pain, why not help them come into it and be a safe space for their pain? If you are the pain, like I am the sticker of pain, why not become safe? You don't need to protect yourself because it's not really, an, it's not real. It, you're, you're just bringing pain. So because I'm like, oh, I'm the problem. Okay. You're not aware to recognize that you're actually the problem here. I can do that. I can do that. I'm self enough. I'm aware enough. Yes, I am the problem. And let me make it safe for you to be here. Because then you're basically like the bully on the playground going, hey, I just want to talk. Why don't you come sit with me? And you're like, mm -hmm. you see that? Mm -hmm. This is very high level consciousness, which means you can't have pride or ego here. You can't really like, I need to be right. If you need to be right, you got pain sore too. Sure. So what I found is if I can go, oh, I'm the, I'm the object of pain. You know, like me being, you know, um, expressive triggers you. Let me make it safe for you to process that, right? Now, you going through this, you may not have them to do this with. They're not going to be a safe bully on your playground, which means that you're going to have to condition yourself to go in and be safe with that bully, which means whoever has a higher level of awareness has to do more work, but it's actually a biohack. That's why you'll notice that when you're in these relationships and you're more loving and you're more kind, what, without degrading yourself, of course, they wake up much faster because healing happens in a safe environment. So if they're telling you from a place of vulnerability that you're the problem, okay, you're the problem, you're the issue, right? And, and they're, that's a form of them being vulnerable. 
even though they're technically incorrect, they're still being vulnerable and expressing that. So why not appreciate that? Make it safe for that. You know, they couldn't tell their mom how they felt. They couldn't tell their dad how they felt. You show up and you're a negative reflection of both of them. Why not be safe? Why not be the safe space for them to reconcile mom and dad through you? Mm -hmm. You might actually help them back to self-love. And then in that case, now you've got a playground, now you've got to place someone on the playground, right? Because now you guys can run as fast as you want. But what happens in normal relationships, and I see all the time, is one person is doing their work and the other person isn't. And not because they don't want to, it's just that's not really their thing and they're not ready to. And, and they have been attracted to you because they know you're going to help them through a biohack by being safe. My job as a mentor, not having all the answers, I create a safe space. I create a safe space for you to unpack your worst parts of yourself. That's it. Because mm -hmm. guess what? I'm going to show you the worst part of yourself. And I'm really like, that's awesome. You're like, what? I'm like, you need that piece. We're going to use this to write your book later. You've been hiding this from the world. That's your magic. Let's bring that shadow out. Let's play with it. Because it's goes on to say, She goes on to say that people are so accustomed to defending themselves mm -hmm. that it is hard for them to hear there is nothing to defend. Mm -hmm. So asking for insight into the approach to reach neutrality. Um, mm. When she reacts and converses about it later, she claim, she's claiming responsibility and sharing her personal insight into the reflection of the occurrence. It throws people off when they have nothing to defend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. Of... It does. It, it well because it rocks their control issues, right? You're going to make them feel unstable. But as someone who is holding a reflection of love, your job is to trigger them, right? Your job is to make them unstable. Your job is to make them wonky. What do you think COVID gave all of us? Right? It gave us instability of our own control issues. Because when, when, when things become uncertain, new awareness can be born. And when you make it so safe for someone to, to just be themselves, at first that might bother them because they've built a whole personality around defending themselves. But what will happen is you stand your ground and you be okay with things not being okay. You be the neutral in the unneutral. You be the eye of the storm. Right. So, OK, it's it's making people very uncomfortable that I'm trying to make them or I'm working on making them feel safe. That should be OK, too. You know, it's like cringy, like, oh, it's hard to watch. But at the end of the day, it's like you holding your position and going, I don't care if you're upset. I don't care if you're yelling at me. I'm still going to be safe for you. Mm -hmm. They will always come back. And go, I appreciated you. Like, I, I was so mad at you, but that it's like they always come back. You know, I've had students literally like verbally attack me over the years. And then two years later, they come back and was like, oh, now I see. Like, I see what you're doing. You're making it perfectly safe for me to be wrong and right, you know, hot and cold, dark and light. But it doesn't matter to me. Because to me, half of your intuition exists, exists in your darkness. And that's the part you're hiding and probably the part you're reflecting out of them that they don't want you to see. So they're attacking you. But if you're just like, yeah, like let's unpack this together. Like, and you know, your job is to just allow, again, there's that magic biohack, allow time, right? People will come full circle and come back you know, let them go get their space, let them take their time. It's almost like whatever they do is perfect. They freak out, perfect. You know, they shut down, perfect. They're going to go through their process of healing and it's going to look different than yours. And that needs to be okay if we're going to have collective relationships. Because we, we need people to be the same as us or in alignment with the way we think because we need to stay safe. And if you need to stay safe, you don't understand how this planet works because safety doesn't exist when you're in alignment and flow because you're always flowing with the perfect moment and the perfect moment will always give you exactly the right amount of freedom and abundance. If you're holding on to your pride, to this, to that, if you have to justify what you know, if you have to protect your spirituality, if you have to, you know, if you have to explain yourself, you know, the, the funny thing is, is I've noticed, especially this year, 
I have been less spiritual, right? I have moved from this like spiritual teacher guru. I'm like, please don't call me that. Like now I'm like, I just want, I'm a kid on the playground. Like if I was going to, that's my label. I'm a child because honestly, there is nothing else I would rather be. And it has nothing to do with my spiritual abilities. I have used all of that to get back to the child, right? Where I'm allowed to have a tantrum and I'm allowed to be angry and I'm allowed to, you know, change my mind and I'm allowed to eat cake for dinner. And you know what? Everything is perfect now because I'm allowing myself to be emotional when I need to be emotional. So I don't store it, pack it, get it triggered later in somebody else. So the more free you are in your own allowance, you're going to trigger people, but you're going to trigger people and, and you're going to shake their pain out. And that's what is happening on mother earth right now. She is shaking everyone's pain out because let's, let's look at this. Let's imagine you have a really dirty room in your house. You don't want anyone to see it, right, at all. And the light is broken in there. Don't go in there, right? Mother Earth is turning your light on and opening the doors. Everyone can see it. So now you have two choices. You can either, like, hide it and build two walls around it and spend your entire life, or you can just be like, this is my mess. Look at it. It's huge. Like, I realized my mom didn't love me, and that taught me how to not love myself. Because see, children don't stop loving their parents. They stop loving themselves. They always take the blame. So your job is not to take the blame when someone is not loving you. Your job is to love them more. Like, find the darkness inside of them and show them how magical it is. Sit with them in the dark and say nothing. You don't always have to be a teacher. You don't always have to be a coach. Sometimes it's like, like my daughter, she's 14. She's brilliant. You know, she'll say something and, you know, I'm a teacher. So I did that. She, Mom, stop. I just want you to listen. <laughs> just some event. Let me be a nightmare. You know, so now I'm like, yeah, get it, get it, get it. That's the most loving thing that sometimes you can do. If people don't want solutions half the time, they just want you to listen. They just want you to be okay with the darkest parts of them. So if you can actually appreciate the dark parts of someone, they will feel so safe with you to express all of it. And then you're hand in hand on the, on the, you know, in the middle of the ground with the bully and you're all like playing a game. Brilliant. Brilliant. Patricia is asking a question here. Um, what if someone is constantly angry about all situations, you are trying to stay neut neutral, then they criticize your opinions, criticize your beliefs. Mm -hmm. It's just so hard to stay in their company. You dread meeting them. How do you deal with someone who's constantly angry about everything? I love it. I love it. Well, there's a lot of people about that. So, well, let's look at anger. And you're, you're going to have to be a little bit more aware here if you are, if you're witnessing this. So anger is grief's bodyguard. Okay. So what they're actually doing by projecting anger and rage and criticism and pessimism and, you know, judgment is they are protecting grief, loss, loss of self, loss of purpose, loss of passion. And so what happens is when they see anyone or anything experiencing love or having, immediately it starts to bring forth that pain inside of them. So they have to have their bodyguard present, which is anger. So anger is grief's bodyguard. So what I would like for you to do if you have this person in your life is to say, what are they actually like, what could they actually be? be be covering up what what pain what painful experiences have made them angry because anger is an elevator motion it should be just like it should just be passing through if it's consistent it's 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 a it's a bodyguard so what did they lose or who did they lose or how did they lose or when did they lose that they had to become a full-time job of angry bodyguard right so because what's underneath that is loss so when you say something positive, you realize that that's going to trigger someone's pain, just like this. Okay, so I just announced my engagement. I can't tell you how much energy I picked up of loss. You think people are going to clap for you and be excited and like, oh my gosh, congratulations. You know what they're thinking? I don't have that. I will never have that. Why does she get that? And instead of going, I'm starting to feel my loss of 
losing my loved one, I'm going to be mad at you for, for showing it off. It's like waving success in someone's face when they didn't graduate. So if you go, I'm going to love their loss instead of give their energy, give my energy to their anger. Now, here's a biohack. If you can't do that, it's because you're hiding loss too. So if you're really triggered by someone's anger and you can't get neutral and understand that that's just loss, it is because you too are hiding loss, but you might be hiding loss by rescuing, by being too available, by being everybody's best friend, because not everybody chooses anger to be their bodyguard. Some people choose service to be their bodyguard. So if I lost my grandmother, right? And I didn't want to become angry because I'm not, I, that's just not my, that's not my joint. I don't want to be the perpetrator. I want to be the victim. Guess what? I'm going to start a crusade for saving everybody's grandmother. Because if I can save your grandmother, I don't have to feel the loss of mine. If I can start a foundation for losing my son for cancer, and I can try to save every child in the world from dying of cancer, I am actually bodyguarding my own loss. Now, I'm not saying that none of those things aren't great, because they're good. We've done amazing things out of loss. But you can hide, you can become a full-blown service provider, or you can become angry. So if you're, usually what you'll do is you're the service provider and you're going to attract someone angry because you both have the same avoidance of loss, but you're triggering each other because I'm like positive, positive, let's save the children, let's save the world, let's save everyone. We can't save everybody. The world's going to hell in a handbasket. And somehow you're attracted to each other. Isn't it funny? <laughs> literally you're both phrase. hiding from loss yeah hell in a ham basket i love it <laughs> and the way you said it your accent is so cool the way you said it. <laughs> um lacy is saying uh high risk equals high reward hearts wide open same within ourselves right mm -hmm. high risk equals high reward hearts wide open yeah mm -hmm. the funny thing about risk you know people always think they're gonna lose something they're risking something uh, you know, and you said earlier on about X, like, I don't know what you described it as, but like people say to me a lot, they say, ah, you know, they could let you down or they could yeah. disappoint you or they could like, you. Mm -hmm. it's just breaking the whole energy flow, man. It's like, it's, you don't know what's going to happen. No expectations, you know? Um, well, and the only reason you'd be afraid of someone hurting you is if you were hiding past hurt. This is important biohack. Okay, whatever you're afraid of happening in the future, you're actually hiding because it's already happened. And that's something that you could unpack. Like, I'm, a, I'm afraid to get into a relationship because I could get cheated on, right? Why? Well, because I got cheated on before. Mm -hmm. So what you're actually afraid of is feeling the pain that you're avoiding in the past again, because you've, you've found a way to keep yourself from that right by being like the perfect version of yourself you're wearing this mask and because you've packed away the pain of being cheated on before you are afraid to get cheated on again but you understand that the law of attraction could never let someone cheat on you if you weren't hiding that pain inside of you of the cheated on it's like you you only attract what you are so if i'm hiding pain I'm going to be afraid of future pain, but if I have no pain, like, you know, it's funny because the, the, this partner that I'm with now, you know, we kind of like talk about like our baggage and like, what's your greatest fear within each other is just to get cheated on. Well, the track record exists. Now I've never been cheated on and I've never cheated on anybody. So that's actually not my greatest fear. Like, I feel totally neutral about that. I'd be like, well, yeah, I mean, if you did that, that would be your choice. Like, but I don't have that in, present in my body. And because I've never done it to anybody else, I don't, I'm not hiding shame of it. Right. So I have no judgment about it whatsoever. So that when, when someone else is saying that they're afraid of that, right. It is because it has already happened. So what you're actually afraid of in the future is only because it's only happened and you haven't unpacked it. So if you actually sat with what it felt like to get cheated on and betrayed and lied to 
and all of the things that go into that experience and you unpack that, you would no longer fear that in the future. So that's a biohack. Whatever you're afraid of manifesting in the future is because it's already happened and you don't remember where you put it. It's, it's like you lodged it somewhere so tightly, like losing your keys that you don't even remember how to process it because you packed it away so tight because it hurt so bad. The things that hurt you the worst, you've put in the deepest parts of yourself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to hide it. So the biohack, Jessica, is to actually write that down, what it is that you're afraid of happening, and then mm -hmm. go into that space on mm -hmm. your own, sit with it mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. feel into it. Right. Yeah. And allow yourself, there's that, that, that magic word again, allow yourself to feel the anger that you didn't feel. Allow yourself to feel the grief that you didn't feel. Because emotion is energy in motion. So whatever you've compacted in your body just needs to be expressed. If you can get that grief out of that last relationship, grief is no longer vibrating and therefore no one can attract, you cannot attract grief. You can only attract what you are. So if I'm attracting people attacking me, it is because I have been attacked and I have not processed that humiliation or that judgment. Because what do we do? It's like someone hurts us. What do we try to do? Run away and be bigger, right? Like my son, he was getting bullied at school. I tell the story. You know, he's getting bullied at school. His solution from a child like mine, he came home and he said, I need a red mohawk right now. <laughs> I said, why? I got to be tough. I got to look tough. You know why? Because he's, what his inner child says is, I don't feel tough. I don't feel tough. So I said, so you don't feel tough. Well, the red mohawk is going to make me tough. Like, give me the red mohawk. No, let's go into the feeling that you're not tough. What makes you not tough? And then it's like, if we go into the feeling of not tough, we can unpack it so he can realize it's not true, right? And then he can feel through it. But it, even the feeling through it is a form of feeling because you're not avoiding it. If he's allowing himself to be weak, to be you know, more sensitive than other kids, to, to be more in tune than other kids, to be less aggressive than other kids, and then I can appreciate that, I love that about you. I love that about you. So as he allows his grief to come up, then I appreciate those weaker parts of him. They no longer become weak, right? So you guys got to, got. we all have to look at what we're trying to do to cover up, right? It's like, what are we trying to do to cover up pain through our physical behavior and actions? Like, you know, I want to be in great shape. So I'm attracted to other people because I don't want to actually feel what I feel inside is this, you know, weird fat kid right because that fat kid still exists if i have not allowed her to come out mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you see what i mean yeah so great questions thanks folks and we'll be just doing a few about another five or ten minutes um jessica i want to do a bit of yeah this is what i'm feeling now so i'm thinking about when you were with us last time we did a little bit of light language mm -hmm. okay and mm -hmm. i know that's a part of your work as well and some people might know um, that's kind of like a universal language. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to, like, when you talk about the new era of love and you describe it using light language, how would that sound? Mm -hmm. You mean in light language? Well, or just like the metaphor of it? Yeah, the metaphor and the feeling of it. Yeah. Well, all light language is the language of love because it bypasses time and space right? It, it breaks down all barriers. It exists whether you want it to or not, right? It's allowing, it's accepting, it's flowing. Like if you look at the frequencies of love. So to me, I love, I love how everyone's remembering their light language now, because what it does is it bypasses pain, right? So if I'm trying to say, Paul, you're amazing and you're talented and you're exquisite and, and all the parts of you that you're trying to hide are actually part of your greatness and we need to really open them up. And what you're going to do is you're going to be like, no, you're just saying that, you know, I'm paying you, you, ha you know, it's like, you're going to push, we're going to push against that, right? Because you don't want to feel vulnerable and you don't want to actually have to feel the feelings of, of not being good enough. So a biohack is light language because what I can do is I can say something to you 
And you don't have an opinion of what I'm saying because logically and consciously you can't understand me. But I am saying all of those things I just said to you in a coded light frequency that bypasses time and space gets right into the core child of yourself, gets into the spirit of yourself, and you do receive it at a subatomic level, even though your whole energy field could be pushing me away, it's like light gets in there, the crack under the door. And what will happen is because all pain is a call for love. If I can speak light language to you, your ego might be like, that was horrible, right? But I got through. I got through. I sat with you in the dark by giving you a language and telling you things about yourself that you've always wanted to hear. And because it's light photonic information, it settles into the cellular memory. So now it starts to activate your body. So people are like, oh, that felt weird or I cried a little bit or felt uncomfortable or whatever your protective system is, your booby traps of love. We'll get in there, right? And it will settle. And because, because a light is, is so expansive, you know, one tiny, tiny, tiny little tea light can illuminate a room. If I can get in there for five minutes, right? And I can kind of put that light in your body, then it can start to interact with whatever is out of alignment and it will start to move it around. And eventually throughout time and space, you will start to remember. So that is one of the greatest biohacks. And I believe that everyone should just let themselves open that ability because that will be the language. Because it's interesting that there's so many different dialects. It's not like, you know, you speak German, I speak English, we can't talk, right? Light language is so many millions of dialects, but it's all interchangeable, which means that yours, no matter if you're this part of the universe and I'm this part of you, I get it. I understand it because love is one language. So whatever language we're speaking, different frequencies of light language, it's all translated the exact same, not put in religious domination, not with numerology. It is one meaning. And that's what's cool about it because, you know, someone could speak light language to me. I could speak like different light languages. We understand each other. How is that possible? Because love has no limits, boundaries, or conditions. It doesn't mean anything other than it is. It's right? The energy and the frequency of it, right, is just so harmonious. Yeah. Right. It's like when you're with your mom or with someone who's very nurturing, and then all of a sudden everything feels okay. It's like you right? don't have to say anything. Yeah. You don't. Have to you say don't anything. have to say anything. Yeah. Right. It's energetic. Yeah. Right. But because it is frequency and vibration of sound, sound will penetrate the third dimension. So we actually require light language, not just light energy, not just hands on healing. We need the vibration of sound to kind of break up the density of pain. That's why, you know, like sound will shatter a glass, right? So if I can use my sound, which is my throat chakra connected to my heart chakra, that's connected to my root chakra, and I can tell you something about yourself, it might shatter your glass, but a couple of weeks, things change, mm. right? Because we're making more space in your body to make that light come in. Mm -hmm. um, I want to talk to you a little bit about um, what's going on at the moment, just a little bit mm -hmm. about how we uh move through these times you know the way you feel like we said earlier about being a bit of an alchemist a bit of a magician mm -hmm. so it's kind of up to you how you how you deal with it but this question is coming in loads from loads of people they're like i'm not really buying into some of this narrative you know i kind of like my immune system i like mm -hmm. my freedom mm -hmm. i know how to live in this world and i'm mm -hmm. i feel good in this world so how do those people what they're asking what they're all saying is what are we to do now in this moment? Do we stand up and say, no, I'm not buying that? Do we go along with it? Do we acquiesce? Like where, like, or do we just create our own realities and kind of give that no attention? So that question is coming true from loads of people. What mm -hmm. do I do right now? I feel like I'm here for a purpose. I'm a little bit of a light worker kind of person. Mm -hmm. 
how do I stand up in the world? Do I need to stand up in the world or do I just get on and create my own reality? What's the deal? I don't think that light workers are all here to stand up in the world. I think that the power of a light worker is to love themselves so obsessively that the light literally bursts out of them and they affect change by just sitting on their couch. You're not here to be a famous writer. You know, you're here to know who you are and love it. Like, I know I am. I love it. I don't care what you think. Like, I'm going to affect change just because of my vibration. And your job is to do nothing except that. If you spent the rest of your life just remembering how to allow and love yourself, you would create more physical change on the planet than writing 15 books avoiding your own pain or giving 30 years of service energetically because you lost your mom when you were younger and you just want to, other people to feel love. It is not about wanting other people to feel love. It is about feeling love and giving it away as an example. Your only job as a light worker is to be the example of the child allowing itself to play. And we all play differently, right? You know, it's like some of us need to go back and reconcile childhood play. You know, some of us need to make the million dollars. Some of us need to learn how to live in the wilderness. And that's their form of play. You know, it's like, it, and, and what I always teach is eyes on your own paper, because the reason Paul is here and the reason that I am here is completely different. But if I'm looking at his paper to figure out who I am, I'm going to live in comparison and judgment of what, well, why can't I do that? Or you might say, well, I can't speak language. Well, just can. Oh, well, then I'm supposed to do something. No, maybe that's not what you are here to play. Maybe you're here to dance light language. Maybe you're here to sing it. Maybe you're here to write it. Maybe you're here to, to, to feel it. Maybe you're here to, to witness it. It's like, it, it's about allowing, like I said, think about who you were before the world told you no. What your only job on the planet is, is to get back to that and play, 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 play. Because when you play, it shoots out energy everywhere and it puts it into the vibration. Everybody is so rigid and structured and controlling and they're so terrified of the future. And it's like when you look at a child playing, they don't know what time it is. They don't care what it is. They don't care what they look like. They don't care like a dirt all over the place. They're just like so in the moment. And it's like you're looking at that and it's so intoxicating that you're like, I just want to feel that for five minutes. So if you can experience that internally, it's like lighting from outside of you, you put it into the collective, we all change faster because we do not learn from someone teaching you how to remember who you are by demonstrating it. Your only job is to demonstrate it and don't apologize if it doesn't look like someone else. If you're like, all I wanna do for the rest of my life is sit on the beach and play with sand or you know, sit on my couch and love my cat, you should give yourself permission to do that. Because if you could give yourself permission to do that without being judged for it, like, oh my God, I'm not doing something big and purposeful with my life. And oh my gosh, I'm not, I'm not writing books and I'm not podcasting. You know what? That's a self-judgment. I, don't do that. Allow yourself to do what you want to do. So it's almost like you have to go give yourself permission to be lazy and do nothing and not contribute only to yourself, which sounds horrible, but the light comes from opening up the self not from giving light away you could only give a light away if you have extra what you're actually doing is creating more pain when you just stay in service all the time it's like only out breathing without receiving right that's that's a great answer that's going to help a lot of people that's great thank you for that brilliant brilliant and it's great to get reminders of that you know because sometimes you do feel like um you know what can i do here and mm -hmm. yeah, that's where your most power is, you know? That's your power is not what can I do? Your mm -hmm. power is what do I want to do? And then notice what judgment comes in. Well, all I want to do is sit on the floor and eat ice cream. Why is that a secret? My, my son tells me all the time, I just want to sit Saturday morning. What do you want to do? I want to sit in my underwear and eat ice cream, watch cartoons. Adult would be like, oh, I, I didn't do anything productive today. And that's not very responsible of me. And I don't have money for ice cream. A child would not live in that space. Therefore, a child is always abundant when it's allowed to be free. 
So if you really want to attract true abundance, which we all do, and true freedom, you have to become the self-focused child and stop judging yourself because most of us didn't even get to be a child. We were so self-aware we had to be the parent. So That's there it. is some healing that has to go in and you have to let yourself be the child, the selfish, indulgent child, because you will grow out of that. And then you will move back into neutrality, but you've got to give yourself permission to just be. This weekend, do. it's ice cream and underwear for me. Underwear, all weekend. All weekend. The whole weekend, it's ice cream and underwear. Yeah. Just think about it. We're not human doing, we're human beings. We're just supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. I've been feeling that a lot lately, actually. Yeah, yeah. So Anne-Marie is saying, thank you for the playful inspiration, Jessica. And I actually, it's good, a good suggestion, Anne-Marie. We're going to finish now shortly, but Amory is asking Jessica if you'll guide us through a short light process. Now I'm thinking something like five minutes where you mm -hmm. bring us into a space and you remind us of that play mm -hmm. and that ability we have to, to play and to connect with that spirit within us all. If you can guide us into that, that'd be lovely uh, to finish on. Are you okay with that? Me? Oh yeah, for sure. Good. I'm always good. I'm always right. I'm <laughs> I know always you right. are. I'm down yeah. for whatever, right? <laughs> well, first, I, I want to make this very intentional because, you know, the, that human part of you likes structure and intention. So what I would like for you to do is all of you just right now, try to reflect back to that child within you, right? And, and who you used to be and not the parts that are bad, not the parts that are hurt, not the parts that, that are, you know, broken, but that, that spark that freedom even if even if the only freedom you had was in your own imagination find that child within you and just bring that child like into your heart for a minute just like kind of like Paul did in the beginning like open your heart but this time just find that child's memory find that child's thought find that child's essence within your within your field a happy memory, you know, a happy moment, a, you know, a manipulating experience where you got your way. It doesn't matter, right? A lie you got out of, whatever. It doesn't matter. Whatever moment felt free, felt good. Remember that child for a minute. And then just imagine bringing them in. Just remembering, putting back together yourself for a minute. And the meditation that I'm going to give you is called permission. You are allowed to be yourself. You have permission to do everything or nothing. You are allowed to be broken. You are allowed to be whole. You have permission to love. You're allowed to be loved. Notice as I'm saying the word permission and allow, what feels and thoughts are coming in? Where in the body are they coming in, All right? What we're doing is we're bringing your kind of baggage up to the surface a little bit by remembering things and triggering certain things within you. And as they come up, what I want you to do is just feel where that little pin, that little pain is, that little distraction is, and just take a breath. Let's make some space. You have permission to let go of the past. You have permission to let go of yesterday. You have permission to let go of the responsibility of taking care of everyone. You have permission to let go of needing to be what everybody needs you to be. You have permission to let go of one-sided relationships. You have permission to let go of the future's outcome. You have permission to let go of holding on so tight. You are allowed to be in pain. You are allowed to feel love.
Now, I just want you for one moment to find one thing about yourself that you appreciate, whether it's your kindness, your generosity, your strength. And I just want you to, through your own awareness, appreciate that part of yourself. We're going to need a little bit more space for where we're going. We want to be in allowing, we want to have permission, and we want to appreciate. Those are our three energies that we're going to require to kind of open that space up so we can let this light in. When you get that moment, take a deep breath. Give yourself permission to receive right now. Just give yourself permission to let in love, to reflect love, to give love. Now, one more thing, I need a little bit more space there. I want you to think back on every person that you can in the next couple seconds who has hurt you. It'll pop up very quickly. Take a deep breath. And give yourself permission to send them love. Now the child sitting in your heart would love some of that as well. So send that part of you that got hurt some love, whatever that looks like, whatever that feels like to you. Hurt people hurt people, right? So when people have hurt you, it's because they're hurting. And because you are still hurting, you're afraid to be hurt again. And that's why these walls you've created with disease and poverty and loneliness. And I'm asking you now for permission to tear these walls down through the language of light, surrender your pride of looking a certain way and just receive, take a breath. I like her in the eye, a horror, she said, Oh, but a back the lane, I had gone a good school in the land, the land, the land, the land, the Ligusk, and we are to wear a new weather in me. I like Saram, why no for a two shy in the car, why no la car. Hello, I knew when they are two car on sheet to take out her at the other. I'm not near and got a letter. I'm <laughs> ハランガアイノウエニナサリオコレテショリタウエンディコココリハカレトシュアイサウタルカシコディアチコトウラシタウンデラウシアイナコイリナファサカハシアドアシオコエニダコフリスリシコサラティアルマサウエナラタ Take a breath. Now in your out breath, let go of anything you're ready to let go of. Anything you're ready to let go of. 
You have the whole universe who would love to help you through what you're holding on so tight with. <sighs> You're all going to sleep like babies tonight. Oh my God. <laughs> wow. a... I just, I'm going to, these are the new glasses that we all are going to have to wear in this new era of love. Mm. Um, when you were speaking that language, I was getting such a buzz and I was yawning and I was <laughs> like, it was beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. I love the rhythm of it. People enjoy that. Raise their hand so I can see you there. <laughs> that was a nice buzz. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Everybody seemed to enjoy it. Thanks, Jessica. That was lovely. And these glasses, these are Jessica Alstrom specials. It will be available on our website. I'm joking. <laughs> uh, in the next while. The future's so bright, I got to wear shades, right? These are my unconditional love glasses, you know? I actually, my family saw a cat wearing these at Christmas and they said the cat reminded them of me because he was kind of just doing whatever he wanted. So they tell exactly. me to buy these glasses and I ordered exactly. them. Exactly. Yeah, right. I looked them up, John Lennon purple glasses. Mm -hmm. So I just want to say um, thanks everybody for joining in tonight and everybody who joined in on Facebook. Um, we'll put this up on YouTube and um, we'll also um, have it, um, yeah, we'll have it out there for ages so everybody can see it. Yeah, yeah, they match her sweater. Yeah, uh, you're right, Flora, you're right. So uh, Jessica Alstrom, thanks for being such a legend. Thanks for um, guiding us all here tonight, giving us yeah. some of your amazing wisdom. Yeah. Anything and we you want to talk we, about as we close, yeah? Well, I want to get with you again, even if it's just a convo that we just yeah. have, because I want to kind of talk about different types of biohacks with technology and future of medicine. So, you know, a lot of this unpacking process is about you sitting in pain, but we also have the whole planet providing, you know, fast tracks and biohacks to help accelerate that. We've got quantum technologies, we've got new medicines coming out that kind of kind of help help your body feel that safe space. You know, not everyone can have a mentor, but what if we were able to give you something that could create that safe space for you to unpack or face that bully? So we should just get on and maybe talk about this a few things that we've got that people can access and use as that safe space while they're going through this process. Cause we're all gonna return to this love place. We're just gonna do it kicking and screaming or we're gonna do it from a peaceful place. And it's really about finding the permission to give yourself to go all the way. Let's do a part two in a month or so and we'll focus yeah. the whole thing on healing. Things like that. CBD, things like the Healy you were talking right. about. And I've got some stuff as well I've come yeah. across and we'll share both and see. Perfect. What we Perfect. Yeah. yeah. We'll be able to bring what you're, you've got to the table. I've got a couple of things and then we just give people options. You know, there's no right and no wrong because we're so different than some things fit with individuals and others don't. But if we can provide as many options as possible, then, you know, that just kind of helps people unpack their baggage quicker because they feel safer. Brilliant. And um, I'm going to ask everybody, I'm just going to hang on with Jessica for a second. So whenever you're ready to leave, go ahead. And I just want to say thank to you. Thanks to you all for joining in. Delighted to have you here tonight. Brilliant. <laughs> See you all again. Oh, yeah, we have our next event as you're going off there. Our next event coming up is uh, with Bruce Lipton. So if you can jump on for that, do jump on. That's March 24th. Yeah, I'll be there for sure. Yes, you'll be there oh, too. Brilliant. You know what? I love his book. If you guys haven't read it, Honeymoon Effect, right? Is the honey, this... that's the that's the love one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's the love one. I recommend all my students in my academy because it there's so much biohacking in there. You know, talks about, you know, when you're in that newlywed stage, how it's like you're vibing so high. Well, you don't need a partner to get in the newlywed stage. Just fall in love with anything, just like kids do. You know, like. And that'll get you into such a higher vibration. It'll help you biohack some of this stuff. So if you haven't read that, read it before you get with them. Well, I'm, I've, I've read that one, but I'm going to reread that one and the biology of belief as well. Oh, yeah. Those are two he, essentials I, love, I, I, I have. He's a really cool dude. He's full of beans. Like he's oh, so, uh, so good. Yeah, so good. He's good fun. Yeah. So thanks everybody again. We'll hopefully see you on the 24th. And uh, yeah, whenever you're, whenever you're ready to leave, go ahead. Um, yeah.
thank you guys for being here. Thank See you, you soon. Everybody. I'll be out there very soon. I know it. See you soon. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you.